Welcome to question and answer time number five. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general, and with the help of my nifty new green screen, or green monitor thing. Def worth a watch. Maybe in a Q&A you could explain bass as being tuned in fourths and your thoughts on it. Good question, kind of an interesting question. Uh, I like tuning my bass in fourths. I've always done it that way, probably won't ever change it. The history of why the bass is tuned in fourth is kind of interesting. Uh, electric bass gets a lot of its history from the double bass. It used to be that double bass actually was a three-stringed instrument. Um, and the tuning of those three strings depending depended on where you were in Europe. So uh, in England, for example, the double bass was tuned a, D, G, kind of like the bottom three strings of your regular bass minus the low E string. In Germany, it was tuned G, D, A, so in fifths. And it wasn't until a little bit later on in the 19th century where they started adding four string basses to add that low E. Um, and it, it, even then, it wasn't until the 20th century where it kind of became standardized that double bass was tuned E, A, D, G. And they did it because they wanted to be able to one, get the lower notes and also be able to play scalar passages more cleanly and effectively because it's very difficult to play clean, effective scalar passages when you're tuned in fifths. And by some sheer coincidence, and I think it's by coincidence, um, E, A, D, G, the sort of default fourth tuning uh, for double bass ended up being the same tuning as guitar, the top four strings of a guitar. So when it came time to invent the electric bass, it was pretty obvious how the electric bass was supposed to be tuned. It was the top four strings of a regular guitar tuned down an octave, or the exact same tuning as a double bass. Everybody wins, so guitar players could easily switch, and double bass players could easily switch. So yeah, hopefully you learned a little bit something from that little history lesson. Hey Adam, I really appreciate your perspective on music. I look forward to your vids every Monday. I've been wrestling with the idea of a solo bass performance, but I'm not sure how to approach this. What would you advice be for building a solo bass performance? So I'm not really quite sure if this is going to answer your question at all, but I'm very ambivalent on the idea of solo bass because on one hand, Adam Neely, the bass player, loves solo bass because I get to play all of my crazy complicated chops. I like to put together interesting, intricate arrangements. Uh, I like to use the bass in ways that hasn't really been done before. And it's very fun. It's a lot of fun to put together solo bass arrangements and sort of problem solve because bass is not the easiest instrument to play solo. However, on the other hand, Adam Neely, the composer and musician, uh, is rather skeptical of solo bass for a couple reasons. Um, actually, only one reason. Um, it can kind of be boiled down to the idea that Solo bass does not really, it's difficult to find an emotional truth in solo bass. And that sort of sounds like namby pamby and like wishy washy, but there's actually a very practical understanding of what emotional truth means. And that is if you think about music from the perspective of a film composer and what they need to think about whenever they're composing music. Because when they compose music, they need to think about whatever the emotional truth is in the music that they're composing and try and match it with whatever the emotional truth is of the scene that they're composing to to which they're composing, sorry. <clears throat> anyway, when you think about music along these lines, it becomes a little bit more difficult to justify the need to play solo bass because maybe solo guitar works better or solo piano or solo violin. And if you're thinking about music from the perspective of a film composer, you start thinking about music very, very differently. And you know, whenever I've been playing solo for solo bass, that's the thing that I like to try and ask myself is like, well, would it, it, does it need to be on bass? Would it actually be better on guitar? And sometimes it actually would be better on guitar, so I then try and learn it on guitar or I don't play it on bass at all. It's a really interesting sort of conundrum that I found, and I, I might talk a little bit about this in the future, but hopefully that gave you some understanding of where I'm coming from with solo bass. On the topic of playing cello parts with differences in cello tuning, it's pretty easy to get a fifth tuning set going on electric bass than double, and a whole lot cheaper, I might add, if you know how to mix your gauges by tension. Calium and Diodari have their tension specs on their site, so there's usually some combination of balance tension you can get if you want to buy single strings and make a set. So thanks for those suggestions. I have thought about tuning my bass like a cello, uh, down an octave from a cello, so CGDA. There have been some double bass players who have had success doing that. I've also seen Michael Mannering do that, um, tune the bass like a cello CGDA, and also play place a capo on the 12th fret, so his bass essentially was tuned exactly the same way as a cello, and then he played uh, one of the Bach cello suites, the prelude to the first cello suite. I thought it was a really awesome performance, but I myself have very, very little desire to do that for a couple reasons. One, yes, playing, uh, tuning a bass in cello tuning will let you play cello music a little bit more cleanly, but at the same time, uh, it's you, playing bass just kind of feels a little strange. Um, I'm pretty set in my ways with my EADG tuning. Uh, I like knowing where the notes are. Uh, there's still a lot of things I want to explore with it. Um, so maybe one day I'll 
tune my bass using that sort of tuning. I have experimented a little bit before, but for the most part, I'm pretty pretty happy with EADG. I've played tuba for many years and I'm currently majoring in music. Any thoughts on learning bass? Well, I think you should do it. I'm a little bit biased here, but I think the bass guitar is a pretty sweet instrument. It's very different, um, but at the same time, you'll be able to translate a lot of the sort of general musical knowledge that you have as being a music major and also as a tuba player. You'll be able to read bass clef pretty easily and just sort of get the understanding of what it means to be on the lowest end of the harmonic spectrum. Um, it is a different, it comes from a different instrument family, bass guitar. And if you succeed on being able to play both, you'll be coming from, or at least you'll be sort of part of the general lineage of bass players who have doubled on several different instrument families, but on the bass instrument. At the turn of the 20th century, there was a lot of uh, jazz bands and ragtime bands that their bass players would not only play string bass, double bass, but also tuba and bass sax. So they'd be playing and be responsible for knowing how to play three separate kinds of instruments that all fulfilled the bass role within the ensemble. A very demanding job, but at the same time, the bass lines themselves weren't very complicated, so they would make up for the fact on just being able to physically play three separate demanding instruments. Hey, do you ever use multiple amps when recording? I play through two amps, an Ashdown and an Ampeg. Do you know of any easy ways to play through three or more amps at once? I pretty much never record through any amplifier, much less multiple amplifiers. I'll record direct in almost every time and then use amp simulation. Sure, if somebody sets up the amp and the microphone and does all the routing and everything and hands me a bass and says, here, play through an amp, sure, I'll record that way. But for the most part, amp sims do a great job. Yes, if you record an amp and then have the same bass line running through an amp sim, yes, the amp will sound a little bit better if you've mic'd it up correctly. But in the context of a mix, there's very, very little difference. And if any difference. And I'm just there, I just want to play a full fat bass line. I don't want to, um, for me, an amplifier isn't a huge part of my sound and a huge part of a sound that matters, at least within the context that I like to play. And the other thing is, and I've known a couple people to do this sort of multiple amp setup, uh, it gets fuller and fatter, definitely, and definitely there's an interesting stereo feel that's really cool sounding. The problem with it is that the sort of the fundamental pitch kind of starts getting lost within the haze of all these different amps going every which way. And that can be really cool in certain contexts, if like the bass is sort of fulfilling the ideal of the guitar, it's like sort of the main rhythm instrument. But if there are other instruments within the harmonic spectrum, it gets too muddy, at least for me. Um, but, so I would just pick an amp that you like, record it and be done with it. To be honest, just that's my own personal preference. Does being adept at one form of rhythmic understanding affect a player's ability to perform or understand the other? Or can you separate quite easily the different understandings in different contexts? Perhaps there is little call for such a facility, dot, dot, dot. I really don't think one negatively affects the other. If you're going to be good at playing pulse-based music, you can still definitely learn how to be really good at playing rubato where the time ebbs and flows and vice versa too. If you're well-trained and just sensitive to the needs of a particular style of music, you're going to be able to apply that sort of rhythmic understanding to whatever the kind of music you're going to be playing. And really, there's not just two different kinds of rhythmic understanding, there's all sorts of different kinds of rhythmic understanding and different shades of rhythmic understanding in between them. So thinking that there's just the classical way of playing and the jazz way of playing, that was kind of a sort of a simplistic understanding for the purpose of that video. And don't get me wrong, there's definitely great classical musicians who can play with great pulse. It's not like all classical musicians are bereft of the ability to phase lock. In fact, you have groups like the Metropole Orchestra, which is an orchestra based out of the Netherlands that specialize in the ability to lock in with a drummer, and they're quite amazing at doing that. Great analysis, but please make a lesson about how jazz musicians can't play rubato, feel the dynamics of a phrase without pulse, articulate, have a decent understanding of crescendo, diminuendo within rhythm, etc. Jazz musicians tend to lock the groove, but not phrase or improvise compositionally precisely because they are too worried about locking in. Whenever you require them to play ad lib, it sounds still and too metronomical and definitely nor articulated. Also talk about how the average jazz musician never listens to classical music. Let us remember that a good phrase can exist without any pulse whatsoever, just like the way you speak. I quote a couple of phrases from my book. Groove without phrasing is just groove. Groove with phrasing is music. Playing time is not the same thing as creating over time. So Alex, I totally understand where you're coming from with this, and I do appreciate the idea of creating a balanced viewpoint here. Yes, a lot of jazz musicians can't do a lot of the things that classical musicians can do. But honestly, it's it's kind of a false equivalency, because a well-trained jazz musician, the likelihood that they'll be able to, say, like uh, analyze a piece of Baroque music or comment intelligently on Baroque uh, performance practice or any sort of classical performance practice is infinitely higher than, say, a well-trained classical musician being able to improvise or speak intelligently about uh, like the Coltrane Matrix, or even just improvise over a blues convincingly. And it has a lot to do with the fact that uh, the system in which jazz musicians are brought up is very much the same system that classical musicians are brought up. It's a very Eurocentric system. There's a lot of classical composition theory and practice 
taught to jazz musicians and taught to any sort of musician who's going through formal music education. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but what is a bad thing is uh, the fact that classical musicians are exposed so little to African-derived music jazz music or any sort of like rock music, pop music, salsa music, anything else, at least in this country, the United States. And it's not like there's no demand for it. Classical musicians are very often very appreciative if they have the opportunity to learn how to improvise. It's very fun. It's very mind expanding. But that's just where we're coming from. Generally speaking, jazz musicians definitely have a little bit of a broader horizon, at least when it comes to understanding classical music uh, versus the other way around. This has been Question and Answer Time, number five with Adam Neely. I'm going to try and keep doing these question and answer videos a little bit more frequently, so please stay tuned. Please comment, like, and subscribe. Otherwise, I have a new lesson or new video coming out every Monday for the foreseeable future. So, yeah, stay tuned, and I'll see you later. Thanks, guys.